Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kent Fox, University of Florida president, and I'm really delighted that we have such a crowd that's joining us for this celebration of the 10th anniversary of the University of Florida Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. And on behalf of our entire university community, I want to extend a particularly warm welcome to our guest and keynote speaker, National Endowment for the Humanities Chairman John Peaty, and to members of his staff who are also here visiting us from the NEH. We are incredibly grateful at the University of Florida for the NEH's support, advocacy, and championship of the humanities, not just here on campus, but across the state of Florida and nationwide. And it is indeed an honor to have you all as our guests today. Thank you. I'm also uh, grateful and I want to welcome Stephen uh, Seibert, who is Executive Director of the Florida Humanities Council, and also other guests that are here from the Council today. Steve, your work to bring Floridians together and shared appreciation for the Sunshine State's unique traditions, stories, and many varied cultures enriches all of us. And then lastly, I want to acknowledge the Mayor of Gainesville, uh, Mayor Poe, who is here as well. And you all, uh, after we finish our talks and we have a break, please come up. He told me that his family is, uh, it would not exist without the National Endowment for the Humanities. He told me the story and I'm gonna let him share it with, with you all privately. <laughs> you can imagine for the next hour or two. <laughs> he, he has a personal interest in the NEH. Well, you know, one of my personal highlights during the summertime, which is rapidly approach, uh, approaching, has been meeting with and speaking to high school students who will take part in, quote, the Humanities and the Sunshine State Summer Program, which is actually co-sponsored by the Florida Humanities Council and our own College of the Liberal Arts and Sciences. And I understand that actually some of those students from that program uh, are here today. It's great to have you. And finally, I want to extend a special welcome to our academic colleagues in the humanities from other universities across the state of Florida. We have a natural partnership, and we want to thank you indeed for joining us as we celebrate the humanities. As a public university, our fundamental mission is to make a serious and a sustained difference in the world. And it seems clear to me that the major challenges of our time, facing our state, facing our nation, are challenges that are shared across human species. The movement of population across borders, increasing stratification of rich and poor. The first and the foundational step in addressing these challenges is to seek a better understanding of each other's and our societies. It's hard to forge this path as we are daily reminded by the headlines about conflict and about violence. But the humanities, I believe, provide the very best mechanism we have nurturing a spirit of openness and a spirit of learning. And through the humanities, we enter into culture, we enter into history, art, and stories, and all of those things that make us both very different from one another, but also utterly the same. Accordingly, it delights me that the experience of our university is in many ways an experience of the humanities. I love it that our students can come here and read rare books in the Judaica suite in Smathers Library experience a contemporary art installation at the Harn Museum, or attend a lecture at the historic University Auditorium. We're a big, we're a diverse campus, but there's a feeling of reverence for learning and for knowledge that I love. At a more programmatic level, all of our undergraduates experience humanities through our general education curriculum. And indeed, we're currently exploring ways to increase and diversify their exposure through the Intersections initiatives that's being funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. I'm pleased that as our students progress, they can choose from two dozen majors in the humanities, from art history to the classical studies, to French and Francophone studies, to religion, to Russian. And it's great that our students and our scholars have diverse and supportive homes among the 200 different university centers and institutes, from the Center for European Studies to the Center for Government Responsibility, and many, many more. Our own Center for the Humanities and Public Sphere that we are celebrating connects our faculty and students across these areas of focus, while also supporting programs for the broad public at large. And it's very much the prime mover of intersections and the hub of UF Humanities. And I'm grateful that we have as our leader in this area, Dr. Barbara Minnell, 
Rothman Chair and Director here with us to tell us more. Will you please join me in welcoming Barbara. Thank you, President Fox. So as the Rothman Chair and Director of the Center for the Humanities in the Public Sphere at the University of Florida, I welcome you to the Center's celebration of the 10-year anniversary of its launch uh, with our special guest from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Chairman John Parrish Petey. Uh, chairman Petey's visit to UF is the first of a sitting chairman from the NEH in over 20 years, so the last one was in 1997. The founding of the center was achieved by the passion, vision, and hard work of faculty members in the humanities, some of whom who are still at UF are in the audience today. And by then, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Dean Neil Sullivan. So the original vision of the center articulated the threefold mission of the center that still lies at its core, and that's one, to facilitate and promote the research programs of humanities scholars at UF, second, to provide an intellectual space and physical location within the university and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences for critical and collaborative discussions of the humanities that reach across and beyond individual disciplines, and third, to provide a place for outreach to the community in which we live and teach. So the center was first called the Nason Center for five years before it was founded in 2005, and then it was immediately threatened by the financial crisis. So it was then launched in 2009 in its current formation by a very generous endowment of Robert and Margaret Rothman. The first interim director, Bob Hatch, and the first externally hired director, Roth and Rothman Chair, Bonnie Efros, created a strong foundation to support the humanities and scholarship for faculty and students at UF and to engage in pu uh, public humanities beyond the university. Since its founding, the advisory board, which consists of nine faculty members from different disciplines in the humanities, has selected 423 awards for research, teaching, and engagement projects by faculty, graduate students, and members of the public. These include, as examples, 35 doctoral summer fellowships, 14 public humanities projects, and 16 team teaching awards. In total, the Center for the Humanities in the Public Sphere has awarded $1,118,886 in funding to 66 different departments, centers, and organizations in and around UF. The total number of attendees at this 271 events that the center supported with grants and co-sponsorships adds up to roughly $80,000. So the center has collaborated and supported units that range far and wide across campus. Humanities questions such as what is the human dimension of climate change or how does history undergird scientific assumptions become the glue that link inquiries and interdisciplinary collaborations across campus. So the center has supported units from the Graduate Comics Organization in English and the Center for Global, Global Islamic Studies to the Seahorse Key Marine Lab. Throughout the years, the center has put on almost 300 events from digital to public humanities, and its speaker series has addressed such topics as, quote, rehumanizing the university, new perspectives on liberal arts, and the work of the humanities, critical thinking in life and labor. In addition, enabled by a grant by the University of Florida from, sorry, by a grant to the University of Florida from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation entitled Intersections, Animating Conversations with the Humanities, the center has founded four groups of collaborative research by faculty members with graduate students who have submitted course proposal to Quest, the new general education curriculum at UF. These four intersections group will also be enhancing conversations on campus with events on such grounds check questions, uh, how to engage eth ethically with divisive questions, or how to imagine migration of black and Latinx cultural identity across the Americas. Look out for those events and the courses that will be offered to undergraduates, and then a concluding symposium in spring 2020. So the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere will continue creating a forum for critical exchange through its programming and grants to initiate conversations among and beyond the humanities. 
It is my great pleasure now to thank all of those who helped us to make this event happen. And for and first most, I want to thank the center's associate director, Sophia Acord, without whose tireless and hard work, we would literally not be here today. I also want to thank those uh, who made this happen at the NEH, and those are those who are here today and those who didn't travel, Peggy Lee Mowers, Mowers Vincent Ricardel, Michelle Young, and Carmen Ingwell. Also the members of the Florida Humanities Council, Keith Simmons and Patricia Putman. We appreciate the support of the members of the Smathers Library who were flexible and accommodating, particularly Pat Reeks and Florence Turquette. We also benefited from the help of Deborah Hendricks. We have to acknowledge the hard work of our graduate students in the center, and that's Brandon Murakimi, Ked Chitwood, Danielle Barrientos, and Lauren Cox as well as the undergraduates, Shannon Moriarty and Chelsea Shea, who are part of a new humanities engagement program that's administered by the center. The UF Office of Research has supported and we're in attendance today at the workshop by the NEH about NEH grants. And finally, a generous gift of the Rothman Endowment enabled the celebration. So I would like now to hand over the mic to Stephen Seibert, who's the Executive Director of the Florida Humanities Council, who will introduce today's guest and speaker, John Parrish PD, the Chairman of the NEH. Good afternoon. Thank you. So if the humanities are the stories of our, of our human experiences told through the lens of history and philosophy and ethics, of literature and poetry, of, uh, of theology, of languages. If that is the case, then John Parrish Petey is the nation's storyteller in chief. <laughs> he comes to this role naturally. He was born in Mississippi and we all know that great writing springs from towns in Mississippi. He received his undergraduate degree in English from Vanderbilt. He received his master's in Southern Studies from the University of Mississippi. He was director of communications at Millsaps College and editor at Mercer University Press. He was the publisher of the internationally respected periodical, the Virginia Quarterly Review at the University of Virginia. And in that role, he interviewed or edited seven Pulitzer Prize winners and two Nobel laureates. He has been the counselor to the chairman at the National Endowment of the Arts for the Arts. He was a literature grants director at that agency, so he understands this grant making process that so many of us are in. Very interesting. He was the director of two large, important national programs, the NEA's Big Read program, for our library people in the audience, and Operation Homecoming, Writing the Wartime Experience program, which helps veterans express their experiences of service and their often difficult reentry into civilian society. John Petey thinks big ideas and he has a heart to match. For seven years, he led writing workshops for US troops all over the world, in Afghanistan and Bahrain, around the Persian Gulf, in England and Italy, and on home bases. He serves on several nonprofit boards, including the National Council of the Margaret Walker Center for the Study of, of the African American Experience at Jackson State University. He has written speeches, for a US president, for a first lady, and for a librarian of Congress. As a book editor, a magazine publisher, a federal agency administrator, a speech writer, and a speech maker, and a proud son of Mississippi, John Parrish Petey is our storyteller in chief. When asked by a Senate staff why he wanted to be the chairman of the NEH, he said, I burn for the humanities. He does, and we're lucky to have him in this role. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of the NEH, John Perry. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for that warm introduction. 
I am reminded yet again uh, my difficulty of holding a job. <laughs> but, uh, but it was an honor to do each uh, one of them. And I hope a through line between the lines of this speech is that a career in the humanities need not have a preordained shape. Indeed, educating yourselves, having the humanities in your life, ideally from a young age, tells you that you can move from field to field to field. For me, the through line was always telling stories, whether that was a podcast, a book, a magazine. Uh, but I, I so appreciate your words. And, and thank you, President Fox, for, for your, your kind words, uh, for your welcome, uh, for your presence. Uh, it is, there are too many wonderful events for any of us to do them all, but one way that you can express your priorities is where, where you are in your daily life. And so uh, your presence means a great deal. Uh, I am honored to be here, and it wasn't a hard decision, but I also felt that Barbara was gonna make the decision for me either way. Uh, uh, we, we met in, in, in New Orleans after a speech. I've uh, had to most, uh, write a, a new speech here because I didn't want her to hear the same speech twice. Uh, so I don't know if thank you is the right word for that, uh, but, uh, uh, but your enthusiasm and your scholarship, I, I will tell you, maybe it's the wonderful weather here, but the point that I've seen since coming here is you can be a scholar, you can be a person of intellectual rigor, and you know what, you can be happy in your, you know, you can, you can be, you know, we, we sometimes feel so beleaguered, right? And, and I'm meeting the students and, and they're talking about their projects, and I'm meeting a professor who's, who, I've seen a briefing book on this professor's work, but I'm not hearing from him or her because they're not gonna take away the time from an undergraduate, from a graduate student. Uh, that's the kind of university I wanna talk out. That's, that's, uh, that's why we have an endowment, it seems to me. Uh, and, and, uh, and on behalf of my colleagues, I, I, I come from an agency with that same ethos. We have 140 people dedicated. My colleagues, Jeff and Carmen, are here. Uh, these are bifocals, so I can't see. I know they're in this general area, but, uh, and you'll see them at the reception, and please talk with them, and, and Jeff just led a grant workshop. And you said in 97, so depending about when that year was, that last chairman was most likely Bill Ferris. I was doing my math here. And I, I have the wonderful honor of being the only NEH chairman educated by another chairman. After uh, Vanderbilt, it was Bill Ferris. He asked me to be his fellow, so I studied under under Bill, uh, who was President Clinton's uh, chairman. And uh, we just shared a stage, and, uh, and I'm so fond of him. And he gave up a lot of books to produce students uh, uh, such as me. And uh, so I'm so proud to have that continuity. And I am pleased, as was said earlier by the president, that leaders from other humanities centers have, from across the state have come here to celebrate this 10-year anniversary with you, to this special day at the University of Florida's Center for Humanities and the Public Sphere. And, and last night, I had the pleasure of joining a small group for dinner that included uh, Jack Davis, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning historian, author of The Gulf, The Making of an American Sea. And I was born in Mississippi, as you had heard. I was born to a father from Alabama and a mother from Florida. And so it seems a book perfectly suited to me, of course. And I was skipping around the book, trying to avoid writing uh, the speech. And I was going back, reading the, uh, the opening and the closing. And the, the title of that final chapter summarized, it seems to me, this Humanity Center in its 10th year. The title is, A Success Story Amid So Much Else. It seems fitting. I, I think that's maybe all we really want out of life, you know, and, and our careers. And this phrase captures the promise of the center's future, as well as its docu well-documented track record of success. And I expect that uh, if all goes well, this university expects to hire some 500 or so faculty members, staff, lectures in coming years, and that this may include additional staff for the Humanities Center. And let me just say that I have no doubt uh, that you will find a strong partner at the NEH 
for the new projects that emerge on this vibrant campus. Over the past 10 years, our agency has awarded more than $27 million to universities, scholars, cultural centers, humanities projects in this state. One of the most important ways we support communities here is through our state partner, the Florida Humanities Council. Annually, our funding equals about half of their operational budget, and they in turn support worthy projects from across the state in every county, including this very center. At the University of Florida, we have awarded dozens of grants, and I talked with uh, grantees this morning at breakfast. Our grants vary from $231,000 to support the Caribbean Studies and the Digital Humanities Institute, to $97,000 for dialogues on the experience of war. This is focused on U.S. veterans that are enrolled uh, in, in university, to $240,000 for the archive of Haitian literature and religion. And again, as I met professors from this project, as well as the current undergrads and graduate students, I, I tell you, I, I don't fear for the future of the humanities when I am in the presence of such individuals. We are in good hands. There is nothing more clearly in the wheelhouse of the humanities, of the liberal arts, than uniting people through the development of their minds. The humanities unveil lives, reveal cultures, explain nations to themselves and to the world. What I worry about is what happens on campuses where we don't have such spaces, such as this humanities center where scholarly arguments can be addressed in a constructive manner. I worry, that is, about the direction of the modern university when it is no longer rooted in the humanities. I mean rooted. I mean anchored down to the bedrock of the foundational tradition of the free exchange of ideas. Time after time, when I meet an undergraduate emerged in the public humanities, I know that she is going to be a better professor or doctor or lawyer, or engineer, or musician, or curator, a better citizen in the world, regardless of her chosen career, because of this immersive experience. The argument I want to make is that the humanities are most relevant when they're most public. Indeed, that's in your own title for the center. If the humanities are to live only within the campus walls, inside the classroom, then that's an impoverished vision of the full capacity of the humanities. Take museums, for example, wonderful opportunities for internships, for possibly uh, uh, credit courses that, that are shared. In the museum world, there are 729,000 jobs, 729,000 people working in museums and historic sites. That's the humanities, too. And I think we have to be more comprehensive in how we explain what success in the humanities looks like. As much as my life was shaped by my humanities professors, they were supportive enough of me to wish me well if I was a book editor, which I became, or a curator, or work for a newspaper, or work for a federal agency. We have to, it seems to me, particularly in the area of graduate education, talk about a successful career as being not only in the academy, but in those areas that operate beside it and in support of it. And I must say that coming from a rural state, graduating in a high school class of 29, I cannot overemphasize how important it is to ensure that people, especially young people, have the arts and the humanities in their daily lives. And there should be no economic barriers to this. I have committed to civic engagement as the hallmark of my chairmanship, which is to say I have committed to access to a knowledge across all seven funding divisions at the agency. To be in the front of a classroom at the university level, you need to be an expert in a topic, absolutely. But we should not get so narrow in our interests that we are no longer focused on conveying knowledge in general to undergraduates. 
In my own field of literary criticism, I worry sometimes that we have spent so much energy dissecting the body that we have failed to tell people how much we love it. As everyday people, we do not read to unpack metaphors, but because we love to read, because it deepens our understanding of the world. It creates empathy in us and enables the, us to go about our lives as more informed citizens. I wish that we could take more of our finest professors and move some of them into introductory classes. I wish we would spend more time talking about how we came to love these works as opposed to chasing buried metaphors between sentences. I wish we would focus more on drawing students into a deeper relationship with the written word and oral culture rather than overwhelming them with jargon-laden theories as a recruitment tool. I wish, in other words, for sinners such as this one, ones that shall become a beacon and a home and a reminder. And I hesitate to launch even briefly in such a complex topic as the state of liberal arts enrollment across the nation. And I don't necessarily believe, believe this trend line of decline is going to change in the near future, but we can take concrete steps to arrest its fall. And in doing so, we can separate humanities anchors institutions from their competitors. Take the field of philosophy, for example. With the rise of artificial intelligence and self-driving cars and medical advances linked to gene mapping, and now the birth of gene-edited babies, infants in China, the need for courses in ethics and bioethics has never been higher in our lifetimes. In the past month, I spoke at a university that created a new class on ethics and technology. They had to open four sections to meet the demand. I can see a business school, a law school, medical school, engineering department coming together with philosophers and theologians at a humanities center to discuss how they might team teach such a liberal arts class. Every year, NEH awards planning and implementation grants to support curriculum changes to help institutions rethink their course offerings in a manner that stays true to their core educational objectives. And I must say that whenever I feel that I'm spending too much time on the bureaucracy of my job, I take myself back to why I'm doing this for a living. And for, in a lot of ways, it's because I love poetry. And in my first NEH speech, a large crowd, I was trying to introduce myself, I was trying to lower anxieties in some ways. I quoted Richard Wilbur, and I was in Boston, not terribly far from where he resided, uh, and he had passed away in his 90s uh, within a few months of that speech. Uh, he was known there as a New Englander, but many people in the room, of course, know him as, as somebody who kept a house in Florida for decades and loved this state. And Richard Wilbur was such a fine person and a remarkable poet, and his poem, The Writer, tells about a father listening from a stairwell to his young daughter at the typewriter. My own daughter, 18-year-old, is, is a violist, so I remember those nights of doing scales, and so this, this is not an abstract poem to me. And the father's there in the stairwell listening to his young daughter at the typewriter, and she is trying to get the words down right. And Wilbur writes, young as she is, the stuff of her life is a great cargo, and some of it heavy. I wish her a lucky passage. The narrator is caught between the pride he feels for her determination and the unsettling knowledge of the writer's life. Suddenly, a memory flashes into his mind of a starling trapped in the same room two years before, trying to refine the open window. His daughter, the young writer, is akin to, quote, that iridescent creature, unquote, that finally finds the opening, clearing, in Wilbur's words, the seal of the world. He closes the poem thus. It is always a matter, my darling, of life or death, as I have forgotten. I wish what I wished you before 
but harder. If you want to know what my values are, if you want to know what my colleagues' values are, they are of the same cloth. We believe in the importance of public service and the essentialness of the humanities, the essentialness of dedicating oneself to a life of meaning and value. And of course, we share those values with each of you. Now, rather than touch briefly on each of the NEH's grant categories, I want to discuss the vital importance of civics education and its, honestly, its alarming condition across many of our high schools, some of our universities, and among the general public. You're on the front lines as educators, many of you, so you know all too well that we live in a time of cultural amnesia. We must take concrete steps to address this issue. It's a global epidemic with clear, harmful societal implications. Think, for example, of the consequences of a world that has forgotten the horror of the Holocaust. As the United States approaches the year 2026, which marks the 250th anniversary of nationhood, NEH particularly encourages projects to promote a deeper understanding of American history and culture and that advance civics education and knowledge of our core principles of government. And by the way, we can't talk about what happened in 1776 and Ford if we're not, for example, talking about the indigenous people before that were here. So we spent a lot of time on this trip to Florida talking uh, about a more comprehensive understanding of not just Florida, but Florida's role in the nation's history. And so I look upon this as a time that we might bring these topics to a higher point in public consciousness. And so by its definition, uh, a 250th anniversary is again invoking uh, a more comprehensive understanding of the very land. And in making this special encouragement of our grant applications, NEH follows the words of the very legislation that brought our agency into creation in 1965. We are part of LBJ's Great Society legislation. And that legislation reads in part, and again, when we talk about technology in this, remember it was only 1965. Quote, democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. It must therefore foster and support a form of education and access to the arts and the humanities designed to make people of all backgrounds and wherever located masters of the technology and not as unthinking servants. The arts and the humanities reflect the high place accorded by the American people to the nation's rich cultural heritage and to the fostering of mutual respect for diverse beliefs and values of all persons and groups. We take these words to heart. Hear that again, democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens, unquote. By the way, not merely in our government leaders, but wisdom and vision in all of us, in everyone. The importance of civics education, civics responsibility cannot be overstated. As NEH chairman, I am also driven by the words of Thomas Jefferson, who, I should say, like all of us, was a flawed, flawed vessel for delivering his wisdom. And yet, many of us in this room can recite entire passages from the Declaration of Independence. Today, I want to linger on a mere sentence from a single letter he wrote some 200 years ago. Jefferson stated, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and will never be. He understood that the future prosperity of any nation is inseparable from having an informed populace. And on that particular point, there is some reason to worry. Only 18% of U.S. colleges and universities require even one foundational course in American history or government to graduate. Some of the consequences of these educational decisions across the nation, one example is 59% of graduates from college stated that Jefferson, not Madison, was the father of the Constitution. 
And when we say 59% of them didn't know, they're adding in people that are above the age of 50 and 60, and they're getting at a higher point, which is offsetting the remarkably low scores of recent college graduates. Fewer than half of these college graduates knew that Washington was the American general at Yorktown. These are multiple choices. You could pick Abraham Lincoln, for example. 40% uh, of college graduates don't know that the House of Representatives has the power to declare war. That's rather shocking. That's, 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 a, that's astonishing. I won't go on except to say that the needs for civic education cannot be overstated. And for more than 50 years, the NEH has been steadfastly committed to addressing this need. We support projects that promote and enable civics education and an understanding of the evolution of the country's laws and its ideals, including when we fell short of those ideals. We fund documentaries and exhibitions on American history and government, such as our, the project we funded that PBS will be airing on the 19th Amendment on the centennial of the suffrage movement. We fund the preservation of our nation's founding documents, keeping our historic record intact for new generations of Americans. We fund essential scholarly research that sheds lights on the events and individuals that have shaped our country, society, and system of government, such as the Martin Luther King Papers at Stanford. We fund educational programs from summer workshops for teachers to National History Day that encourage an understanding of America's history and government. And of course, our educational website, Excitement, offers curricular resources and lesson plans for free for teachers, students, and lifelong learners on the Constitution and related topics. And at the NEH, we are focused on civics education across all the funding categories, including cultural infrastructure. And by infrastructure, we do not only mean bricks and mortar projects. We do not mean only preserving artifacts related to the Revolutionary War or the Civil War or only presidential papers. We mean, for example, the very place we are gathered here to celebrate. We mean land records of forgotten Spanish settlements and photography archives of towns lost to hurricanes. We mean born digital immersive cultural experiences that will play an increasingly significant role in educating the next generation of students. In short, we mean that the culture of the humanities is to be ever strengthened. The culture of the humanities is the culture of resilience. It is the culture of knowledge, of tolerance, of inclusion, of diversity. Your presence here means that you understand the humanity's value and its fragility, and you're committed to shoring it up. We, as a nation, need to attend to our cultural resources because if we do not, slowly but surely, we will lose our way. We will lose any deep and abiding understa understanding of our nation's ideals. I was reminded of this fact in the rain and the night fog as my colleague and I walked the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum and paused before the rows of empty lit chairs and took in the sight of the smaller chairs, the ones that represented the children at daycare killed in that act of domestic terrorism. Our guide pointed across the dark and stoned outline of the building toward survivor tree, the American elm that came through the destruction and around which survivors and visitors gather today to find comfort and solace. After tragedy, and I know the state has known tragedy, after tragedy to the extent that healing is to come, has come, will come, it is through the humanities, through the act of documenting, sharing, reflecting, claiming, that our communities move toward a greater sense of wholeness. So no, the humanities are not a luxury, are not frivolous, are not divisive. Rather, the humanities are what bind us together in our common journey, especially in times of the better angels that Lincoln spoke of, seem so far away. Your humanities centers and museums and libraries, your talent-filled classrooms, these wondrous spaces are not citadels, they are sanctuaries. 
friends, teaching history and civics and, ed and ethics, and in sharing the public humanities is essential. It's not hard, but it's not easy either. It is mostly about researching the facts, finding a through line, shaping a narrative, and staying with it. Even when it seems like no one on the other side of the room is listening. Having gone across the country over the past year, two years, rather constantly, having seen the value of your work constantly, I can attest that someone is always listening. Sometimes you cannot unlock the full truth because it resides in a past lost to history. But by and large, the humanities are about writing and reading and preserving and presenting forgotten and overlooked and even marginalized stories. In April of 2018, I had the great honor of being unanimously confirmed as chairman by the U.S. Senate. And the next morning, I delivered the annual luncheon address for the American Council of Learned Societies. There I spoke about optimism. My belief in the importance of optimism has only grown in the years since. Of course, I read the same Chronicle of Higher Education articles that you do. I see the same research. I know that trend lines can be depressing, and yet I'm an optimist. I worry about what has been lost, de-emphasized, or ignored in our culture, such as civility itself. And I worry about our capacity to bring it back, and yet I'm an optimist. With eyes wide open, with a sense of realism, with historical understanding, I still believe we must do everything we can to commit ourselves to optimism, not merely for ourselves, but to those who come next, so they too can live meaningful, impactful, fulfilling lives. I have long been in awe of Reinhold Niebuhr as a theologian, as a witness, as a citizen of the highest order. In rereading his work, I came across this passage in his essay, Optimism, Pessimism, and Religious Faith. Niebuhr discusses what he calls the self-destruction of modern optimism. He's writing this between the world wars, and he's already talking about the self-destruction of modern optimism. And he writes, and I quote, history does not move forward without catastrophe. Happiness is not guaranteed by the multiplication of physical comforts. Social harmony is not easily created by more intelligence. And human nature is not as good or as harmless as had been supposed. Sobering words. I believe in many ways he hit the mark here. And yet, how many of us in this room have optimism precisely because of humanists such as Niebuhr? because of citizens such as Niebuhr, because of books such as his books. Reviewing the Library of America's collection of Niebuhr, the scholar Ronald Stone said that this specific essay represented, quote, penultimate pessimism and ultimate optimism. I like that phrasing. May we always restrict our pessimism to the penultimate position. Think for a moment upon the letters that generations of Americans cast into the abyss of war. Every writer of letters, every reader of stories, every presenter of history is an optimist. Every one of these acts is a statement that there's a future which you want to inform and enlighten and educate in some way, large or small. It is all of that and so much more. And so as I have said, I am an optimist, have always been an optimist, will always be one. Every grant maker is, at heart, an ultimate optimist. And because you are here in this room, on this day, for this reason, I cannot help but think, in spite of all the barriers, you're an optimist too. Thank you. So we're moving on to the second part of the program, which are um, 
a showcase of humanities projects. And so when Sophia Akert and I organized the celebration, we wondered how to select from the many individual and collaborative projects that have been associated with the Center for the Humanities and the public sphere over the years, or that have been spurred by funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Florida Humanities Council. So how could we capture the breadth of scholarship in the humanities from studies about 18th century divas from Italy, or um, the um, environmental history of the gods. So how could we sum up the depth of the research projects that engage in the detailed histories, philosophies, and reflections of cultural expressions and human endeavors across the globe and throughout, throughout time? But also, how could we offer a representative cross-section of humanities research and address both those who are visiting today who are not in the humanities, but also offer something for those who are in the humanities disciplines? And so we decided on three projects. And these projects, what they share is that they're all collaborative and multimedia, that they all relied on multiple sources on funding, that they all engage with diverse units on and off campus, and that they've all been undertaken by different generations of scholars. So we're not claiming that this encapsulates all the entirety of humanities research at UF, or that you know they represent what we do, but that they give a little glimpse into the variety of research that has been supported by us, by the NEH, and by the Florida Humanities Council. And so I'm gonna rep uh, introduce each presenter and each project first, and then they're gonna come up and present, and then I'll come up again. So our first presenter is Jeffrey Pufa. He's a lecturer and theater director in the Center for Arts and Medicine with MFAs in theater performance and theater director, directing, sorry. His work at UF focuses on creating theater to address social issues and community health in order to engage the public in critical dialogue. He was a creative campus scholar in residence in the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, where he co-developed a course on devising oral history performance for social justice. Today, he's going to introduce his work with military veterans and the theater play that he produced and directed in collaboration with the community entitled Telling Gainesville. The project, as you will see, brought together four veterans and a military wife and weaved their life stories into a theatrical production from which he'll show us a short clip. Jeffrey partnered with The Telling Project, a national performing arts nonprofit, also supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, that employs theater to deepen the understanding of the military and veterans experience. You have Center for the Center for European Studies, so we have a representative here, supported the project with funding from their grant from the NEH Dialogues of the Experience of War. Additional support came from the Samuel Proctor Art History Program. The Florida Humanities Council awarded him a community grant to mount the play. The Actors Warehouse in Gainesville performed Telling Gainesville and the Veterans for Peace screened the video. So you will notice that Jeffrey and the play Telling Gainesville connects these different units on campus and community organizations to state and federal funding agencies while it addresses concerns on the local, regional, state, and national community. So please give Jeffrey a hand. Good afternoon. It's an honor and a delight to share my work with you all today and to celebrate the 10 year anniversary of the Center for the Humanities in the Public Sphere. Thank you to Barbara and Sophia for inviting me today. Four years ago, I began my work in the Center for Arts and Medicine here at UF, and my director, Jill Sonke, put me in touch with Sophia Acord and suggested that we get to know each other. What a fruitful meeting it was. I can recall my early conversations with Sophia around what the humanities were exactly, <laughs> and what was the relationship between the arts and the humanities exactly. And we pulled it all apart so that I could actually frame my work in the theater in order to engage with the humanities and the community more fully. You see, I'm a storyteller and I'm a theater maker. I believe that inside the theater, this is where we can experience our humanity in the most visceral 
and deepest way. For me, it's where dusty and forgotten texts can come to life. And it's the only place I know where we can experience our darkest and most brilliant selves while simultaneously connecting with history, philosophy, architecture, music, dance, and more. The theater, for me, is the vessel that holds it all. Telling Gainesville was my first project when I came here to UVet. And coming from Canada, I wanted to understand more deeply the experience of war through the eyes of American veterans. And I wanted to connect those stories to the public through the theater. And as a documentarian, I wanted to frame it all through the lens of health and ask the question, how does engagement with the humanities create healthier communities? A colleague of mine then connected me to the Telling Project website, and so I called them up. And I said, hey, do you want to work together? Surprisingly, they said yes. <laughs> so shortly after, Sophia called me and said, I think you should go over and talk to the folks in the Center for European Studies. So I did that. And I discovered that they were planning to bring a similar project in from Sarasota. And I said, well, that sounds brilliant, but what about having our own local production here in Gainesville? Well, they consulted with the NEH, and it was decided that the funding could go to the Gainesville production. Lucky me. <laughs> Shortly after, I connected with Patricia Putman, and the Florida Humanities, and she began to work with me on funding different aspects of the production, enabling me to hire a musician, a stage designer, to create the special atmosphere that was needed for this production. It was all coming together. So I put out a call in the newspaper looking for veterans for the project. I mean, where else to start? I pounded the pavement, I contacted local veterans organizations, and I showed up at their meetings, and I stood up in front of them and gave them my pitch. Would you like to come share your story and help connect civilians to, to veteran stories in order to build community? Well, I got some blank stares, and I ate some good muffins and drank some coffee. And eventually, I had nine veterans who came forward and one military wife. Over the course of three days, with the help of the oral history program, we recorded their oral histories. And as I look back on those three days sitting in that room listening to those stories, it really was one of the most impactful experiences of my life. At the end of it, I felt like I had been punched in the gut, but also deeply grateful to have been given the opportunity to hear those men and women relate stories from World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, and Iran. Ultimately, four veterans, Scott Camille, Victor Lopez, Rafe Johnson and Andrew Moore and Sue Dudley, the military spouse, decided to move forward with the project and perform the play. Max Rainyard from The Telling Project worked on scripting the play with me and uh, from the recorded oral histories over the summer of 2016 and together we shaped the play. I started rehearsing with the cast that fall and we met weekly over the course of four months together. A lot of it was at my house. We sat around my dining room table and we told stories to each other. For me, these stories never had to be word for word. They never had to be memorized. But the veterans needed to know their stories. They needed to connect to their stories and know what they wanted to share. It wasn't easy, but it allowed them to explore digressions and created the space for new events to surface that they hadn't shared in their original oral histories. I worked on them with the details, how to deliver a good story, how to connect with an audience. And we laughed, and we cried, and slowly we became kind of a family together. Eventually, we did, as we say in the theater, get up on our feet, and I began staging the show. We laughed even more, and we became even closer. You see, by then, they realized that they were really in big trouble. <laughs> they were actually in a play that was going to be on a stage, and there would be an audience attending. But instead of running away from that fear, they faced it and connected with each other more deeply because they were in it together. No man would be left behind. Uh, luckily, they had an amazing woman in their company. Sue was incredible. She was 80 years old at the time and was the first one to learn her story and her staging. 
She was on time for every rehearsal and was always ready to work. She led the way, and her stories were fabulous and provided a unique perspective to life in the military. Her stories of living in Okinawa during the Vietnam War and living in Newfoundland during the Cuban Missile Crisis were especially fascinating to me. We finally arrived at the Actors' Warehouse in early November of 2016. The Actors' Warehouse is a small community theatre here in Gainesville, and I wanted to create the feeling of closeness that only a small theatre can create. By the time the Veterans' Day came and we opened the play, you couldn't get a ticket for the show, and the theatre was filled to capacity every night. It really cemented to me that there was a need in this community for this project, and that the public was ready to listen and connect with these veterans. It really was an incredible experience to be present in the theatre with the storytellers every night. Hearing those stories, and then listening to the incredible discussions that ensued post-show is something I'll never forget. People were deeply moved by this production. I think it was healing for many. For the storytellers, I believe it was indeed transformative, life-altering for several of them. They finally got to say what they needed to say. And Sue, Sue went on to publish a book of her stories. You know, there's something magical about the simplicity of a group of people in a room together telling stories. And I think it becomes even more magical when these stories are fragments of our collective history and memory. The stories in telling Gainesville connect us to world events in a personal way, events that changed the direction of humanity. And we had the privilege to see inside to understand more deeply and to empathize with those who were there. Ultimately, I do believe that engaging in the humanities makes us healthier. And this project helped me see that more clearly. Our wellness and health do improve through community connections and the sharing of our stories, our history, and our discussion. Ultimately, the humanities, I believe, help us see that even in our differences, we are more alike than different, and we're all part of the same family. Thank you. dropping atomic bombs on us. We even had duck and cover drills. The Russians were communists. I didn't know what a communist was, but I knew it was okay to kill them. I grew up in a very strict household. I had to obey my parents. I had to obey my school teachers. I had to obey the rabbi. And I had to graduate high school. And because I was lucky enough to have been born in the best country in the world, as a male, I owed time to the military. On my high school campus, we had military recruiters. It was a time of the draft. And the recruiters would say, you can get a better deal if you sign up now than waiting to be drafted. So I opted for the better deal, and I signed up in the delayed enlistment program, and three days out of Graduating high school, I was at Paris Island, South Carolina for boot camp. It was 1971, and uh, I was about to graduate high school. But Gainesville didn't have very much to offer me. And I was walking downtown, and I saw this sign that says, Uncle Sam wants you. 
Well, you know, uh, I had relatives, cousins, and others that were already in Vietnam, and they would put on television a clear, vivid statistics of the casualties of American soldiers over there. And I said, well, I don't want to get killed in Vietnam. So I went back and I talked to my guidance people at the school, and they told me about the uh, delayed entry program. August the 5th, 1971, I joined the United States Navy. My grandfather was in World War II and my dad was in Vietnam. He wasn't there long, he got shot on his third day. When I was younger, military service was talked about something that's honorable, something that would teach you discipline. But I was the only one of my brothers that joined. I was 24, I had a job in 9-11, it just happened. But what really made me join was my wife had Crohn's disease and no insurance would cover her because it was a pre-existing condition. So I thought she needs care and this is a way to provide that. So on February 14th of 2002, I left for basic training. What a Valentine's Day. See you later, honey. I gotta go. My mother moved from Mexico to California before I was born. Uh, I have two older brothers and one older sister. Growing up, uh, my mother was gone most of the day. Um, she was out working. Um, but when she was home, she was very disciplinary with us. Um, and because of this discipline, my siblings ended up rebelling. Um, my brothers ended up joining gangs. My sister got pregnant in high school and me witnessing all this um, as the youngest, um, I kind of felt like I needed to go a different direction. Um, so I also rebelled, but in my own way. <laughs> And uh, it was very hard for me because a lot of the times I w in my community, I would be approached by some of these gang members and I would get jumped because they wanted me to join them, but I didn't. So after high school, I tried the whole community college thing, but really didn't work out for me. And uh, instead, I just ended up working at a Starbucks and I would spend my off time surfing in Monterey, California. And uh, I was very alone um, a lot of the times that I was out there um, when I tried to get away. Um, looking back at things now, I kind of realized why some of the kids end up joining these types of groups. And a lot of times it's because they want to feel appreciated or loved or supported, something that they're not getting at home or elsewhere. But again, that just wasn't for me. So in uh, March of 2009, at the age of 21, I enlisted in the United States Army. My story is different. My father was in World War I. My two older brothers were in World War II. One in the first group that crossed the Rhine River, the other in the first train that went through Hiroshima after those bombs. In 1953, when I was 18, I entered the University of Missouri. That next summer, I went out to the University of Arizona. And there, outside of Tucson, on top of Mount Lemmon, I met Ronald. Dismissed. I always wanted to do that. <laughs> Our next presentation showcases the Digital Library of the Caribbean, and the group of speakers includes Associate Professor Leah Rosenberg from the Department of English, Laurie Taylor, Chair of Digital Partnerships and Strategics Department, and Crystal Falima, a 2017-19 Council of Libraries and Information Resources Postdoctoral Fellow in Caribbean Data Curation in Smathers Libraries. And this collaborative project has garnered many internal and external grants. So I'm just going to highlight those that are particularly dear to our heart today. So I start with the Center for the Humanities and Public Sphere support with two library enhancements grants, one from 2011 and a current one from this year, and the Center's grant for, the sym for a symposium in fall 2016. The Digital Library of the Caribbean also includes the Voodoo Archive, a freely accessible multimedia archive of primary material on voodoo religion and culture, supported by NEH Collaborative Research Grant in 2012 for UF scholar of Haitian Creole, Ben Hebethwaite, and he's sitting there, and Duke University historian, Laurent Dubois. 
Also, in collaboration with UF librarian Hélène Huyet and historian Paul Ortiz, Laurie Taylor and Ria Leah Rosenberg, who are part of the presenters, have been awarded an NEH grant for Migration Mobility and Sustainability, Caribbean Studies and Digital Humanities Institute, which will take place this summer at UF. So please help me welcome Leah Rosenberg, Laurie Taylor, and Crystal Falima. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Laurie Taylor and I'm thrilled to be here to share about engaging the humanities with the pedagogy of the Digital Library of the Caribbean, or DLOC. DLOC is a collaborative digital library with over 70 international partners who work together to create and share content that is openly accessible for the world and it's to build community and capacity for Caribbean studies and public humanities. There's so many stories about DLOC, so we'll start with the one in this photo. These are two of our collaborators, Drs. Moreza Gonzalez and Nadja Rios, who are from the University of Puerto Rico, which is a DLOC partner. In the photo, they're at the US Virgin Islands in St. Croix, the easternmost point of the United States. This photo gives you one point of location or one point of departure to start from, which matters because DLOC is all about the Caribbean, the Circum-Caribbean, the diaspora, and all of our connected communities across the world. So with this one point of departure, we have the next, um, with the University um, of Florida, uh, where we are. So UF has always identified as a Caribbean institution. In 1969, UF was, part of, was one of the founding members of ACURAL, the Association of Caribbean University Research and Institutional Libraries. UF led within ACURAL this deep, collaborative, um, and rich community uh, in 2004 to create DLOC as a digital library made by and for partners. As a cooperative digital library for resources from and about the Caribbean and Circum-Caribbean, DLOC partners are the heart. They retain all rights to their materials and provide access to digitized versions of Caribbean cultural, historical, and research materials currently held in archives, libraries, and private collections. DLOC was founded in, at thanks to, in part to two grants from the U.S. Department of Education and transitioned from project to program funding in 2011. And that's thanks to the University of Florida and the libraries um, and so many of the partners really taking this on for um, permanent support ongoing. DLA continues to pursue grants to grow faster in terms of content, providing training and building community. And DLA overall is the house or the umbrella, ensuring long-term preservation, online access, incubation space, and support for projects as a foundation to grow community and capacity. So we, the people who comprise DLOC, we work to connect, to amplify, to elevate, and to celebrate Caribbean studies. We follow principles of mutual aid and solidarity together as part of and in furtherance of a beloved community. So DLOC is now the world's largest open access collection of Caribbean materials. This includes all types of materials, artwork, museum objects, books, photographs, historic letters and documents, audio, video. Shown here is a photo of Olive Senior, Senior, a critically important writer, poet, and scholar. And we have some of her written work, video of her reading her poems, and video of her scholarly presentations all in DLOC. Newspapers are another major strength. This includes newspapers from uh, Puerto Rico, thanks to the National Digital Newspaper Program. And communities, trainings, and meetings are also the core in, a core in DLOC. With traditional digitization, uh, born digital curation, and so much more content, our questions include how do we connect people, communities, and resources? How do we make meaning? How do we put in place the conditions for the use of the materials to be transformative and for the process of working together to be transformative? And Leah and Crystal will share their stories of community and transformation. So I joined the Scholarly Advisory Board of the Digital Library of the Caribbean in 2008 and focused my efforts on expanding the collection of literature and cultural journals from the English-speaking Caribbean, particularly from the early, and 20th, early 19th, I'm sorry, the early 20th and 19th centuries, texts that tell us much about the cultural history of the region, but that have been overlooked by scholars, in part because they were often accessible only in a few libraries in the world. 
This collection, that is the expanding collection we were able to build in DLOC, has supported a paradigm shift in Caribbean literary studies that expands its corpus from the traditional starting date of the 1950s back into the 18th and 19th centuries. In 2011, I was awarded a library enhancement grant, as Barbara mentioned, from the center to digitize literary and cultural journals from Jamaica. Through this grant, the National Library of Jamaica digitized Planter's Punch. A glossy Christmas annual, Planter's Punch offers a window into social and cultural history of interwar Jamaica and includes literature not published elsewhere. Previously available in three libraries worldwide, as part of DLOC, Planter's Punch has been viewed over 17,000 times. When the center made this award, Dr. Akert explained to me that it was a seed grant. This made me very nervous. <laughs> but, it has, but it has led to projects and grants that have expanded the collection and its objectives beyond what I imagined possible. When Planter's Punch became available, Rhonda Cobham Sander, a leading professor in Caribbean literature who led the effort to expand the field, or has led the, the effort to expand the field into this earlier period since the 1980s, suggested that we design and teach a hybrid course as a pilot for further collaborative intercollegiate courses using DLOC as a platform. UF faculty, I'm sorry, faculty at UF, the University of Miami, Amherst College, and the University of the West Indies, Barbados, collaborated on the course, which addresses West Indian migration to Latin America and Asian migration to the Caribbean. Large-scale post-emancipation migrations often overlooked in the literary and national historiography. We sought to increase DLOC's holdings in these areas, to foster collaborative teaching and research, and to make the experiences and contributions of immigrants to the region more visible. And we've taught the course in various forms at the graduate and undergraduate level in three, three times. Students produced materials to elucidate the collection. What I'm explaining here is that we sought to build DLOC by having students and faculty contribute their materials, including student final projects, enhanced metadata, lecture notes, and including videos like um, the one of Olive, Olive Senior who came here to speak. Teaching the course gave us a new objective that is making DLOC a commons for collaborative teaching and research. This led us to organize roundtables at the West Indian Literature Conference and a symposium here at UF for faculty, students, and librarians engaged in collaborative DH projects and based in the United States and in the Caribbean. And we asked participants what they would find most useful for us to pursue. And in both fora, people recommended that we apply for an NEH summer grant to train, sorry, to train a larger cohort in teaching Caribbean materials. Um, and to teach them not only in Caribbean studies courses, but in a wide range of courses where Caribbean material is relevant, such as Victorian literature, American history, religion, sociology, and education. Um, and this May, as Barbara mentioned, we are hosting Migration, Mobility, um, Migration, Mobility and Sustainability, Caribbean Studies and the Digital Humanities. And I wanted to conclude by noting that indeed plant digitizing that one and I thought obscure journal did lead to many projects and grants. Um, and in fact, in addition to when we got grants for two symposia, not one from the center, um, as well as Olive Senior's talk and two um, enhancement grants. We also received funding from 14 other units on campus, which included federal funds from the Latin American Studies Title VI grant, as well as from the National Leader, I'm sorry, as well as from the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences National Literature Grant, grant awarded to UF to incorporate the Panama Museum 
the Panama Canal Museum and its community. And we received as well financial and in-kind support that was really invaluable from Amherst College and the University of Miami. Hi everyone, my name is Crystal Falima and I'm a CLEAR postdoctoral fellow in Caribbean data creation. My fellowship program, it's a two-year um, fellowship program that offers recent PhD graduates the opportunity to develop their skills and explore um, interest in librarianship and information technologies. I'm grateful to be a part of this program because it supports a new generation of scholars in humanities. My particular focus of my postdoctoral program centers on exploring the best practices in digital, hum in digital humanities and critical pedagogies in Caribbean studies. I do this by exploring um, teaching and pedagogy, pedagogical practices in my undergraduate courses at UF. Here's a picture of me with three of my students at a conference banquet in Haiti. And I'll share a little bit more about that in these next slides. Um, so these students here in this photo took a course, Haitian Studies, uh, Haitian Studies course in spring 2018. I had the pleasure to teach it um, after one member of my dissertation committee offered for me to uh, teach the course. And I structured this course as a digital humanities course. I wanted to see the opportunities, sorry, I wanted to see the opportunities that emerge from connecting librarianship and teaching through this particular course and I wanted to explore how DH offers additional ways to promote student engagement. I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and this course allowed me to share my fieldwork experiences with my students. As a graduate student here at the University of Florida, I work with Den, um, Dr. Ben Helpthwaite, who was a member of my dissertation committee, and he was awarded an NEH grant to document Haitian religion and culture. And under this grant, I traveled to Miami and Haiti to document Haitian voodoo ceremonies. And from my experiences, I contribute content to the voodoo archive of DLOC, and my students in the class have the opportunity to see Haiti, Haitian voodoo in a more holistic way. And so by highlighting content via DLOC and other digital platforms, I introduce my students to digital humanities and the importance of public engagement, collaboration, social justice, decolonization, and inclusion. For my students' digital projects, they created collaborative websites instead of turning in traditional um, written papers. And so my students curated images, songs, maps um, within their sites, drawn from DLOC and other platforms, and conceptualized the literature and multimedia resources in a more purposeful way to have them rethink Haitian studies in a more engaged way. We transmit this information, um, amazing information through Instagram, Facebook, and other social media platforms. But one of the main goals for the class is to have my students to think about alternative narr narratives of Haiti. And I wanted my students to consider their role um, in combating negative images of Haiti and how we need to, as scholars and teachers, um, counter these exaggerated stories through their collaborative voice, through my students' collaborative voice. And so towards the conclusion of this course, we held a digital scholarship showcase, which is here at the top. Um, and my students had four projects. One project was on Haitian culture and society. Another class um, project was on Haitian voodoo. We had one on Haitian um, relations and also gender in Haiti. We had several students outside of the um, class participate in, well, uh, participated and um, attended the digital scholarship. Um, showcase, we had individuals from um, students' parents came to this digital scholarship showcase. Um, and we had an amazing opportunity to, sh again, highlight how students can talk about Haiti in more inclusive ways. Several students from this course shared their interest in taking their interest further. And so um, they asked me, how could we go to Haiti and share their projects? And so I submitted a proposal to the Haitian Studies Associ Association Conference. Um, that was held in Port-au-Prince, Haiti in November of last year, and their um, proposal was accepted. And this is my students at the bottom. We are in Haiti um, presenting at the Haitian Students Association Conference. So, yeah. And last week, several of my students, again, um, presented at the Florida Digital Humanities Consortium um, Conference in University of North Florida, 
And so we have had an amazing opportunity, my students and I, talking about public humanities, engaged scholarship, the importance of public humanities um, in international development, and also we've considered future plans to showcase the, the Caribbean through multi-narratives. This summer, for me, I won a, was awarded a internal grant to take students to Puerto Rico for us to conduct narrative research. And so we will conduct narrative research on the impacts of Hurricane Maria, but we will also create a digital storytelling project that highlights the human experience, public humanities, and again, public engagement. And so at the University of Florida, we are creating really amazing opportunities for students, faculty, and staff to produce engaged scholarship to not only connect with our communities, but also to collaborate with our communities through transformative experiences. And I was just going to leave the, um, uh, so the Digital Library of the Caribbean is open for everyone. Um, we encourage everyone to collaborate and work with us as so, we do so often with our 70 partners internationally and worldwide. Thank you. Okay, so our final speaker and performer will be Navid Bagrizan, who's currently a visiting assistant professor of music composition at UF, and Laurent Estopi, who's a saxophonist, composer, and sound artist who's involved in numerous collaborative projects in multiple art forms in the United States and Europe. So today, Laurent uh, comes to us from Greensboro, North Carolina. Navid, who will be speaking, had been a TEDA Family Doctoral Fellow in 2017 to 18, awarded by the Center and endowed by a gift from Susan and Warren TEDA, who are in the audience today. Or did they have to leave already? Oh, they're, they're, they're not here at the moment where I mentioned their name, but they were here until then, <laughs> and they will be back afterwards, right? Okay, but we appreciate them anyway. Um, so with, the fe with Navid, with his fellowship, he traveled to Germany. He conducted interviews and research on experimental operas in his now completed dissertation. In the summer of 2018, Navid was a composer in residence at the uh, UF's Harn Museum of Art, where he composed the title a piece entitled Pictures at the Micro Exhibition from two, uh, 2018. So obviously a play on pictures of the exhibition and it was in conjunction with a miniature exhibition of Japanese art. So in the following presentation, he will tell us more about this process of composing the piece and the connection to the exhibition at the Harn Museum of Art. And then Laurent will play a short excerpt from Navid's composition so we understand, my, we can hear and understand microtones. We have to understand them first to hear them, many of us. So please help me welcome Navid and Laurent. Thank you. Uh, let me just go to the next slide. Yes. So, uh, Watanabe Shotai, the Japanese artist of the late 19th and early 20th century, came to Europe to absorb Western styles of painting. His uh, mini illustrations uh, of the natural world, which prompted my musical work pictures at the micro exhibition, uh, synthesizes Japanese and uh, European Impressionism. As a composer, I ask myself the question, how do I build a bridge to Japan? How do I relate to the nature? How do I integrate diverse musical cultures within the framework of Western art music? How do I infuse multiculturality and inclusivity in my sound structures in an increasingly multicultural and inclusive world? My answer to these questions was microtones. Microtones are the small tones in between half and whole tones. They don't exist in the Western major and minor scales, but they do substantiate several non-Western musical cultures, including Japanese music, and the natural spectrum of frequencies that uh, constitute any acoustic world, so-called harmonics. Microtones as a means to expand my sound structures to non-Western musical traditions, as well as rhythmical 
patterns inspired by some non-Western traditions uh, substantiate these four pictures of the micro exhibition. This suite also pays tribute to, uh, not to pictures of the micro exhibition, but to picture at an exhibition, a seminal musical piece by the 19th century Russian composer Modest Mussorgsky, a contemporary of Watanabe, and an early influence on musical impressions. Uh, I would like to thank the Harn Museum of Art, particularly Mrs. Ivy Chen, um, University of Florida's College of the Arts and School of Music, Dr. Anthony Kolenik and Dr. Kevin Orr, and the Center for the Humanities and Public Sphere at the University of Florida, Dr. Menel, Dr. Akor, for supporting this project. Uh, thank you for inviting us, Dr. Menel, Dr. Akor. Thank you for having us, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to welcome a fantastic artist, my friend, Laurent Estopé, for whom this suite is written to perform the piece. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
coming to the end of our program, and among all the unique things of this afternoon, I think the most unique is that we finish before time instead of <laughs> going over time, as is typical for humanity scholarship. So um, I want to thank you all for sharing our celebration with us today, and I invite you to go upstairs to the reception and join us there. Um, and so I, there are a couple of people that I would like to ask to stay behind, but everybody else is welcome to follow the students upstairs to the reception.